This is the year of the quad. Since the last Olympic Games, snowboarders and skiers have perfected a trick called the quad cork, which looks and sounds ridiculous because it is. It's five full spins and four full flips, all in the span of about three seconds. But you know who spins a lot faster than that in way less time? Figure skaters. We're gonna find out what it takes to spin your body four times in the air in a fraction of a second and why spinning five times could be almost impossible. Three years ago, British snowboarder Billy Morgan pulled off the world's first quad cork. Morgan will be at the Olympics, as will Andre Rogetli, who last year became the first person to do a quad cork on skis. Mind you, these are some of the world's best athletes. Rogetli's crazy parkour workout went viral this fall because it's like a superhuman Rube Goldberg in the gym. But only a few years ago, skiers and snowboarders weren't even sure the quad cork was possible. Which raises an interesting question. Are we at the limit of how much a human can turn and flip through the air? As amazing as the quad cork is, it might not be the limit. One physicist calculated that a boarder could actually complete six or more corkscrews. That's because snowboarders and skiers get hang times of close to three seconds. That may not sound like much, but it is a lot of time to a figure skater like 16-year-old Din Tron. He's an up-and-coming skater in San Francisco. He took home the silver at Junior Nationals this year. So you're here today to practice quads, right? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, try. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Emphasis on try? Yeah. But getting that quad down perfect is tough. Din and other skaters don't get a ramp to launch from. They have only their leg muscles to propel them about a foot and a half off the ice. And then they've got just about six tenths of a second to rotate and land. It's one really big fast motion, so you jump up in the air and then you kind of pull your arms in and your legs in at the same time. If you've ever seen a skater spin, you've got the idea. They start with their arms extended, and as they pull their arms in, it causes the rotation to speed up. Same thing when they're in the air. That's because of something called the conservation of angular momentum. Angular momentum depends on both the speed of the skater's rotation and the position of the skater's body relative to the axis. That's the center of their rotation. The closer the body parts are to the axis of rotation, the faster they spin. And then, of course, there's the landing. Or you have to open up before you make contact with the ice, which stops the rotation and is a definition of landing. Quads have become pretty much mandatory for the top male skaters, thanks in part to U.S. national champion Nathan Chen, the first man to land five of them in one program. To get a better sense of what it takes, I bounced with an Olympic skater, got insanely dizzy on this thing, and talked revolutions per minute with this guy. My name is Jim Richards. I'm a professor at the University of Delaware. I work with the United States Figure Skating to assist coaches and, and skaters in performing multiple revolution jumps. Richards is a professor of kinesiology, and he uses motion capture technology to map jumps and help correct slight imbalances that can throw off even elite skaters. We learned a long time ago that most of the skaters jump high enough, and most of them leave the ice with enough annual momentum to complete the jump, but most of them fail in the air. They adopt a position that doesn't enable them to spin as fast as they need to to complete the jump. To learn what that kind of rotation feels like, I got some help from Tim Gable. He was the first American to land a quad in competition and did three of them on his way to a bronze medal at the 2002 Olympics. They called him the Quad King. You're actually known as the Quad King, right? I was the Quad King until Nathan Chen came along and unseated me. <laughs> so what did it take to become the Quad King? I think it took uh, a lack of fear and probably a little stupidity. <laughs> and some time on the trampoline, which skaters use to practice their jumps. I mean, you get more hang time on a trampoline. You can experiment with the technique and the air position a little bit more with a lot less wear and tear on your body. I'm all about less wear and tear on the body. So just one easy turn. And Gable made it look pretty easy. But for me, totally different story. Tim gave me a lot of pointers on how to engage my core and spin more efficiently. Right arm is out. Right arm's out. Core is engaged. And... All right. Well done, my friend. Three to go. 
I asked him to time me while I went for my magnificent spin and a half. And 1.08. Well, you get enough hang time to successfully complete a quad. I get so enough hang time to successfully. That's impressive. Even after dozens of jumps, I never made it to even two nice. revolutions, much less four. One of the reasons to train on a trampoline is that ice skating, for all its grace, is a brutal sport. Researchers at Brigham Young University actually attach sensors to skates to record the impact forces of landing big jumps. From the data that we've collected with the instrumented blade, we found that skaters land with somewhere between five to eight times their body weight. Even on the safety of a trampoline, there was no way I was ever gonna pull off a quad like the elite skaters if I couldn't spin faster. If they're going to successfully land a quad, peak rotation velocity is going to have to be 400 RPM or higher. That's crazy. To pull off a quint would involve even faster speeds, so fast that Richards doesn't really think they're possible. In order to land a quint, which puts their average rotation velocity around 400 RPM, that would put their peak rotation velocity closer to 500 RPM. Wow. So the highest we've ever actually seen is, is, is about 430, 440 in that range. So you remember how pulling your arms in can actually make you spin faster? There's a way to practice that at home. It's with one of these things. It's called a gold medal pro spin trainer, and it's basically a human turntable. It is, per the instructions, for serious skaters, so naturally I tried practicing with it and basically just made myself sick. And then I brought it into work for my coworkers to try. Pretty sure none of us got anywhere close to hitting 400 well, RPM, even if we all felt that way. But there might be a way for professionals to get the speeds they need to do a quint. And that's with these. They're weighted gloves. And in an experiment, Sarah Ridge and Jim Richards had athletes wear them while performing jump spins. I'm going to show you why from the safety of this chair. So if you have a greater amount of angular momentum because your arms were out wide and because you had an extra mass further away from your axis of rotation, once you're in the air and you bring your arms in, that extra mass is that close to your axis of rotation. All that's left is you're going to increase your rotation speed. And it works. Kind of. At least for the first few jumps, all of the skaters were over-rotating, which meant that the gloves were doing their job. But after a few more jumps, all of the skaters adapted back to spinning the way they did before the gloves. But even if skaters could learn to use the weight to their advantage, there's no guarantee that it would be enough to spin them around five times, let alone that it would be legal. So we're probably not going to see a quint anytime soon. And it's not hard to see why. Spinning is absurdly difficult. Even on a trampoline, getting twice the air that the pros get, I could barely do it one and a half times. And it looked terrible. Spinning, even a little bit, made me feel nauseous. And I never even tried it out on the ice because this place would not let me. So at this year's games, when you see people spinning and they make it look really easy, remember that it really, really is not. In fact, it's right at the edge of what is humanly possible.